So everything's lined up and nice and neat and even, and that causes the overall shape to have typically a sort of geometric quality to it. Now, <clears throat> fairy stones are crystallizations of three things. <laughs> it wants you. <laughs> I found one. <laughs> Aluminum, iron, and silicon. And when those three materials crystallized, they formed a little hexagonal prism. Now that's your single crystal there. So technically speaking, all of the crosses are two crystals that have intersected during, during the uh, crystallization process, grown off and or rather grown through each other. A hexagonal prism, of course, a hexagon is a six-sided shape. The hexagon of the hexagonal prism is some, well, usually not equilateral, so the sides are different lengths. You will have four long sides with two smaller ones to it. But sometimes it's perfectly hexagonal. It just depends on the piece. Pass that around to get a look at it. Um, now this is a actual cross, but if you look, you can see the two pieces that make it up. And then if you look at the top of one of them there, you'll see the hexagonal shape. Um, so, the reason they crystallized is, of course, they went under heat and pressure, and that was uh, caused by, basically a very long time ago, about four to five hundred million years, in the area here, or what would be the area, of course, it wasn't like it is today, probably wasn't even in this location it was Everything drifted over here, regardless. Um, basically what happened was there were two tectonic plates. Of course, the Earth, the crust of the Earth, the uppermost layer of the Earth, it's not a uh, single, solid, unbroken piece. It's, it's separated into really large uh, chunks called plates, and they'll float around uh, on the layer that is underneath them, called the mantle. The mantle of the Earth is made up of molten rock, magma, uh, it's very hot down there, there's a lot of pressure, that heat will uh, cause the rock at that depth to actually melt, turn into a liquid. And uh, if you've ever, well, everyone knows, heat rises. So in that mantle, the material at the bottom is hotter than the material at the top because it's closer to the core of the earth and it's deeper down so it's more hot. And over time, that will eventually rise as the material at the top cools and it makes a convection current. It's called a convection current. It's like a big treadmill, basically. And that will move the surface and cause the, excuse me, the plates of the Earth to drift around in whatever direction the current's moving. Anyway, in this case, two plates ran into each other. One was kind of right low enough underneath the other one to get caught up under it, and as it moved, was pushed by those convection currents, the only place it could go was kind of underneath and down. It's a process called subduction. What that does, of course, is move a lot of the stuff on near the surface of the earth, down underground. The deeper down you go, the more heat, more pressure there is. Well, here, <coughs> there was the right amount of iron, aluminum, and silica, and at a depth of four to five miles, in that one mile band, there was the right amount of heat and pressure. Lower, there's too much. Shallower, not enough. But right there, four to five mile range, right amount of heat and pressure, all the necessary constituents to cause that crystallization to occur. Now when everything formed, oh, where are you, there you are. It did not form loose, like you will find them today. When the fairy stones formed, they formed inside of another material here. This is called, this rock here, it's called schist. Metamorphic rock, change from one form to another, once again, caused by that heat and pressure. And we'll pass this around so you can get a better look at it, um, but you'll notice all of these little lumps are fairy stones inside the schist rock. Yeah, just be careful, it's a little heavy. heavy. Yeah. <laughs> um, take a second to feel the fairy stones and 
feel the schist rough. There's a bit of a texture difference to them. The schist will have a grainier consistency than fairy stones, which are more homogeneous, smoother. Now, you'll also notice there is a sort of glittery quality to the schist rock itself, and that is caused by pick it up. this right here, just the presence of mica. Uh, my, mica is commonly found in schists. a crystal as well. It's a silicate crystal. Much like quartz is a silicate crystal as well. It just kind of crystallized a little different. Its crystal structure is very long, flat sheets. And what it does is it's quite hardy, relatively speaking, this way, but on this axis, it's very fragile and shears off. You get these little thin sheets of mica. Um, the glitter you see in the rock there is basically crystals like this on a much, much smaller scale. And you're glittering. Yes. <laughs> As you can see from just handling it, uh, it's very yeah. flaky. So you probably won't find anything like this. I found. Sorry. You're fine. Phone's actually working. <laughs> I found uh, little pieces out there, but this was probably dug up. You can see how flaky it is when it's exposed to the elements, it tends to weather down fairly A formation of mica like this is called a book because it's got pages to it. Now, mica, uh, it's, it's prevalent enough in the area that um, back around the early 1900s there was a mine here in the area, sort of a little down further past where we're going today. To my knowledge, they used mica as it had insulating properties, heat insulation properties. Did they sometimes use it almost in, like instead of glass. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that was a little before the industrial use of it, but it was when glass was a luxury, <laughs> mica did the job fine. People, uh, I mean, there are people even who use base sheets of it. You can see, I mean, it's clear enough that you can see right out through it when it's uh, in those thin sheets. But anyway, little aside there. It uh, has nothing to do with fairy stones. So, <laughs> where'd that rock go? When all of this formed, of course, it was quite deep underneath the Earth's surface. Nowadays, of course, you find them right there sitting on the ground. Well, something happened to bring all this back up. And that was the formation of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And that came up basically just pulled all the earth up. And really the way everything worked out, just through chance, I suppose, um, pulled a vein of it up to the surface close enough that everything gets acted upon by the wind and the rain and the process of erosion and washes everything out, wears everything out. Um, there's just that one vein, and it's out of the park, well, out of the park, it's out on the other end of the park, let's say it that way. It's a very narrow vein, maybe three quarters of a mile to a mile wide, but it's fairly long, I'd say 15-ish miles long, roughly. Now, there might be fairy stones on this side of the park. This is conjecture. I'm willing to bet that there's a continuation of that vein. It's just when everything got pulled up, it didn't get pulled up to the level that those are. It's the way everything worked out. That's why you don't find them. You can't just go out on the trail right here and find them. you got to go to two lots. 
In any case, when this material was brought to the surface, or close enough to the surface, of course, it was acted upon by the forces of nature and began to weather away. The schist rock is, on average, softer than the prairie sandstone, and it will weather away first, which leaves the prairie stones to be carried along in relatively good condition and pretty much just deposited right there on the surface of the trail we'll be on. Now, of course, when I say softer, I don't mean soft, it's all relative. Um, so a piece like this here is not uncommon, not super common, but you can find pieces of the schist rock where it has not completely weathered away yet, and the fairy stones are still embedded in it. Now, a piece like this, you know, you can sort of use your critical thinking skills, and it probably was sitting like this, face down. You can see on the back side of it suggestions of fairy stones there, there, and there. And all of this side got the weathering, and the fairy stones that wore out, of course, carried along. Some of them just wore down and didn't pop right out. And this side was protected from all of the weathering, and that's why you can see the good fairy stones on it there. You know, if this had sat out there maybe another hundred years or so, a lot of these would have been separated. But, you can still find pieces like this, but for the most part, <clears throat> nothing that big, nothing that good, and the majority of them are once again loose, like you see there. Now, <clears throat> of course, we talked about the single crystal hexagonal prism. That's the basic form of everything. Uh, you can find just single crystals in addition to all the crosses. In fact, single crystals are quite plentiful. They're one of the more common things you find. Uh, the crosses, there's three varieties. The St. Andrew, Maltese, and Roman. Now, the St. Andrews is the most common cross. You pass those around there. These are all St. Andrews. Uh, I would say the vast majority of everything out there is a single crystal or a St. Andrews. <laughs> St. Andrews is a cross where the intersection does not occur on the 90 degree angle. It's more of a 45. So, sort of a diagonal versus a perpendicular. You can see with those there, um, they all look a little different from each other. They're still St. Andrews. Not every St. Andrews looks the same as every other St. Andrews. It'll all be based <laughs> on the portions of the single crystals that intersected to make them. So you can have big, fat, squat ones, you can have long, skinny ones, everything in between, but they'll all have two pieces on that 45, regardless of the overall proportion. That's so the they will get bigger? Oh, I find bigger ones? Bigger, not big. Okay. I'd say about the largest is, the largest I've seen anyone find out there is about, what, half dollar? But yeah, they can get big. They can get real small too, but we'll, we'll touch on that in just a second. So, like I said, St. Andrew, St. Crystal, most common. The Roman and Maltese are a bit more rare. I'd say it's about one in a thousand, give or take. Now, there are, like I mentioned earlier, hundreds of millions, if not more. That's probably a very conservative estimate of the fairy stones out there. So just with the sheer volume of fairy stones, it's not like you have to spend weeks looking to find the Maltese or the Roman. You know, one in a thousand is not the best odds, but when you can pick up, you know, a nice handful of rock and probably have about 500 there, it's a bit better. The more you look, the more you'll find. You're not going to come home with a pocket full like you will with a single crystal of St. Andrews, but you can very well find a couple you know, if you look hard enough. 